cannot sell it, separate Easter, resurrection from the death, burial. It's all a part of the same package, that great and glorious gospel. Back in the early 1900s, churches used to go by the moniker, many of them, full gospel churches. And that's because they came to recognize that it's not just a, one part of, of repentance and trying to live a good life. It's not enough just to confess Christ. But you need to repent of your sins. You need to be baptized and you need to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's all tied together in the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We're going to celebrate all of that today. But I'm going to take you back to the first Passover, Exodus chapter 12. And um, let me just begin reading for you in verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. And I'm going to just stop right there. I'd like to see somebody get born again of water and spirit today and have a brand new beginning. It shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Say that with me. A lamb for a house. Verse 4. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls, every man, according to his eating, shall ye make account for the lamb. Now, he goes on talking about the specifics concerning the lamb, but let me just begin right there. Pull my text, or pull my title out of my text, and I'm going to preach to you uh, from this title found in verse 4, Too Little for the Lamb. Too Little for the Lamb. God's good, folks. Before this service is over, we're going to baptize Albert and Ricky in the lovely name of Jesus. We got the baptistry filled up and ready, fresh water for this, this glorious Sunday. They'll never forget this Sunday when God washed away their sins. In the Old Testament, they just rolled them ahead, but now we wash them away. Let's lift our hands, let's worship, let's ask God to bless the reading of his word, the preaching of the gospel. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for this great congregation, these great number of souls that are in the house today. I pray for the help of the Holy Ghost. Anoint me and allow me to say what I should say for your people today, and I give you honor and glory. Thanksgiving for the work that is being done on this Resurrection Sunday. In Jesus' name, and everybody shout amen. amen. God bless you, and you may be seated. Praise God. So the passage that I've read to you from, I've already said it, it was the beginning of the very first Passover that is in the Scripture. Now, to give you a cheater, to give you a heads up, this Passover was a foreshadowing of Calvary. It is the early typology of the sacrifice of a, of a, of a lamb. And uh, it was fulfilled on that day when they took Jesus to the cross, nailed him to that cross, crucified him, put him in a tomb, but the tomb could not hold him. Soldiers that were there could not hold him because the power of resurrection came out of that. But to the Jew that day, to the Israelites, the time of bondage was coming to an end.
deliverance was about to take place. It might look bleak and it might look dark, but we're on the brink of the greatest event that had happened at that time. And I can't help but feel like we're in that kind of place right now in history where we're at today. God sets the stage for things. God prepares the atmosphere, the people, the surroundings. And he did that day. God had been preparing Moses for 80 years. God had been working on his man, both preparing his spirit and his experience so that he could deal with the people and take them where they did not know. Brother Chris, you might say if you've never been there, you're not sure about it. But Moses had been there and he knew where to carry them. And so God had prepared them. He had prepared the Israelites. Nine plagues, nine plagues had prepared the Egyptians and Pharaoh. Pharaoh was getting so tired of this conflict between Moses and his God. The people, the crowd, the public was crying out, get rid of them, let them go. But there was one more miraculous event that was left in God's arsenal. He had one more thing on his agenda, and the history of the Jewish people was about to be forever changed the death angel was about to go through Egypt there was judgment that was about to be visited upon every household every person in that land they were going to be touched by the effect of the death angel that brought that from the greatest and the most noble household to the poorest. It didn't go by economics. It didn't go by anything. It didn't even go whether there were nice people or not. It was just the fact that God was sending judgment and it was going to take place. There was only one thing. Somebody shout one thing. There was only one thing that was going to prevent or stop that judgment from coming. That de predetermined decision was, was simply the only thing that could stop it was the blood of the sacrificial lamb. <laughs> Woo! Somebody shout hallelujah. The blood of the lamb was going to have to be applied in the proper way. Well, I don't like it like that. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it really doesn't matter what you think. It matters what God says. And when God says this is the only way of escape, I would just simply take it at God's word that he would do, you would do what God bids you to do. Somebody shout amen. amen. It was time to prepare the lamb. Careful consideration had to go into the selection of the lamb. Later on in Jewish life, it would be called Selection Day of the Lamb, the tenth day of the first month of their year. Their year didn't fit our year. It wasn't exactly the same calendar we use. But on the tenth day of that first year, it was Selection Day of the Lamb. They had to go out among the crowds. I need a little more monitor up here, Elder. They had to go out among the, the sheep. They had to go out among the flock. And they had to look for a lamb that was without blemish. There could be no natural imperfection, no disease, no deficiency, no redundancy of parts in that lamb. So I'm reading my uh, Fox News, just in case you're curious what my... Uh, bias happens to be politically and uh, which you weren't but I threw it in there anyway and so as as I was reading Fox News last night there was an article that talked about a woman in the state of Mississippi who was rescuing 
rehabiting a lamb that if it was left on its own would have died. And of course they're applauding her and they're talking about how wonderful this woman was that she has given this five-legged lamb a second chance. She said, my vet didn't think it was going to pull through. He was infested with maggots. He had a bad infection. He had an extreme high fever. But he pulled through. And after she gets him back up where he ought to be, he's got to have hernia surgery because he's got problems. Now, a lot of people, if they were going to have to give up a lamb, would have taken that little lamb because that lamb didn't matter. That lamb you could live without. That lamb, it wouldn't cost you anything. It was something that probably wouldn't have survived anyway. But God doesn't want your rejects. God doesn't want what you would have thrown away anyway. There's too many people that the only time they live for God is when they begin to have physical problems, when their life is in such a mess. I want to tell you, God, God will take you like you are. But I'd like to see some people live for God from their youth up, from their innocency up, from the time they began. I'd like you to give God your everything. Now, that's a moot point. That's off to the side. But I just want you to know, as cute as that little, I started to put a picture up there, but it wouldn't work anyway. Camera's right. As cute as it was, it wouldn't have made the selection day for the lamb. It had to be a male of the first year. You see, you ladies get off on some things. It had to be under a year old. It couldn't be over a year old. It couldn't be an old goat. <laughs> Actually, they allowed the selection between either a lamb or a goat, and he could have chose either one. just had to be a small uh, either sheep or goat that could have been selected for this. But, but he didn't want some old, tough, decrepit. We're going to lose him in the flock anyway. He's lived out his days anyway. No, God doesn't want your leftovers. He wants your best. He expects that which is going to give him honor and praise. And then the next qualification on this selection of the lamb is a very interesting one. Because from the 10th day of the month to the 14th day of the month, they had to keep the lamb up. Now, I didn't mean they kept it awake, but what that literally meant when they had to keep it up was they had to bring the lamb into their house. And for four days, they had to take care of the lamb. They watched the lamb. They watched to see if it was, was, was crippled. They watched to see if there was any disease that showed up. They watched to see if there was anything that would be would be unqualifying of the lamb. They kept the lamb close to them. Now, now that, that was practical in its application, the fact that they would be able to know over a series of days whether this lamb qualified or not. But there's only one problem with bringing a lamb into the house. I woke up this morning dreaming one of the most stupid dreams I dreamed that Juju was so hung on my side I teased somebody and said he might as well be sewn onto my side he's just right there and I woke up and the dumb dog was sleeping right on my hip I mean he was right there Juju's getting gray headed Getting a white muzzle. He's getting old. I like having a dog around. I really do. My wife, she says, this is it. I don't believe her. Not one bit. So I'm driving to Visalia the other day, 
And me and Juju's heading down there. She's taking care of the grandkids. And we're going shopping down in Visalia. And I'm running down Road 80, and there is a small puppy out in the middle of the, of the median in Road 80. And it's, it's not near any houses. It's out there in one of those stretches where there is no house around. And that puppy was out foraging for food in the middle of that highway. And you know, I just think to myself, poor dog, I hope it doesn't get hit. Man, Juju, <laughs> I ought to go back and get him. But I know better. Number one, because I'm on my way to Visalia, not on my way back to, from Visalia. And I'm going to have to take this dog with me all the way shopping, and I don't want to do that. But. You pick up a dog like that or a kitten like that and you bring it into your home saying, I'm going to take it to the pound and get rid of this thing. And you give it a bath and you feed it a little bit and guess what happens? You start getting attached to the lamb, I mean to the dog. No, I didn't slip. I said it intentionally because what happens is when you bring that lamb, that cute little fuzzy thing into the house and you pet it and you let it sleep beside you and in a few days you're attached to the lamb. Oh, let me tell you something. When you fall in love with the lamb, and then you realize that lamb's got to be sacrificed for your life. It affects you when you allow that blood to be shed. Now, some of you may have never fallen in love with Jesus like we have. But understand that he gave up his life willingly for us. Nobody took it from him, but the Bible said he laid down his life for his sheep. He did it for our sake. He became sin and took our sin upon him for our sake. He willingly did it. But when you get close to the lamb and you begin to love the lamb, that means that that sacrifice becomes all that more precious to you. And so you need to get close to the lamb. But what really intrigued me about this passage in verses 3 and 4. What really intrigued me about this passage was the, the statement that was made concerning the size of the household and the lamb. If the household was too little for the lamb. And that just stuck out to me. It's just like, mm, got to chase that out. Got to find out about it. Because that lamb on the 14th, was going to be slain, the blood was going to be caught, it was going to be taken with a, with a kind of a homemade brush made out of hyssop, and they were going to take that blood, they were going to dip that hyssop into the blood, and they were going to put it on the doorpost and upon the lintel of the, ho of the house, and when the death angel came around, if that death angel saw the obedience to the word of God. I cannot stress this enough because before any miracle takes place, there is obedience that has to take place first. Well, I don't think that we ought to give up little lambing. I don't think that Mary ought to sacrifice her lamb. Let me just tell you something, saint of God. It really doesn't matter what I believe or what I think. It matters what God said. And if God said to do it, the only way to be spared from the judgment that is coming is to obey the word of God. They took the blood and they applied the blood and then they took that thing, they, they cleaned it up, they, they roasted the lamb. Now the scripture is clear, don't you boil it? Calls it sodden with water, 
Don't you boil it. I know you might like, might like lamb stew, but I don't want you to make lamb dumplings. I want you to roast the lamb. And he said, when you do it, I want you to eat every bit of it. Because if you don't eat every bit of it, you don't get dessert. <laughs> Not a part of the lamb. I'll just take the back strap, please. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of picky. I don't like the bones. It's probably too small for lamb chops. I just want, I'll take the hind pieces. I don't like the front legs. I just want the, you got to take the whole lamb. You can't just take part of it and throw away the rest of it. Don't get me preaching because I can do it real easy. I'll, I'll take a doggy bag, please. You ever notice that doggy bags really don't end up for dogs? End up, except for Juju. We take, we take some kind of a takeout container. I'll just take it for the road. We're going to be on the road for a few days after today. I think I'll just pack some up in a picnic. No, you've got to eat the lamb tonight. It's got to be consumed tonight. There's an urgency about it today. It's got to be done now. I'm fixing to preach in this house because there's a mindset that some of you have that you should not have because you put off the concept, the idea. I'll, 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 I'll get right with God someday. I'll do it one of these days. I'll get around to it when I'm ready for it. But the scripture is clear. There's an urgency in the spirit that says you've got to do it now. You've got to consume it now. Not a part of it, not your favorite pieces, but you've got to consume the lamb and you've got to eat it all and you've got to do it now. What was not eaten was burnt with fire. They had to eat it with their loins girded. They had to be prepared and ready to go. Shoes on their feet. The staff in their hand. It wasn't a picnic where you sat down and you ate around the table. It wasn't a formal dinner. You ate it with your hands with one on, on one with that stick. You were dressed and ready to go and you were eating the lamb, consuming the lamb, ready to go. How much more typology do you need? The fact that when you eat this lamb, you got to be ready for the rapture. We're fixing to be delivered out of this world. I'm telling you, we're in the end time. We're in the last of days. Prophecy is coming to pass. And if you're not ready, and if the blood's not applied, and if you haven't been where you ought to be with God, if you're not obeying God, you're going to get left behind for the judgment that is in this world. But to those that have made themselves ready. Let me just tell you, God's allowing us to spoil the Egyptians and we're gonna take the best out of this old world and we're walking out of this place. God's fixing to bring us deliverance and victory. But you gotta be ready. You gotta be ready now. Now, I was raised in a household that, that taught, held the idea, you waste not, you want not. I heard an echo in the house, a pre-echo. It was ahead of me. There's somebody preaching before. They might have got my notes, Mark. Waste not, want not. You eat what's on your plate. My wife puts a lot on my plate. I, 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 my, I know you don't believe this, but my tummy has actually shrunk some in the last year. And, and I can't eat what I used to eat, but I haven't convinced her of that. And it's hard to convince me of that because it's just not in me. And you can ask her to leave anything on my plate. It's hard. She says it goes to waste one way or the other. She said, I, you can just leave what you don't want to eat. But, but I, it's hard for me to do that. I guess I was raised, I wasn't raised in the depression, but I might have been raised by depressed parents. But anyway. <laughs> Apparently God has the same philosophy. 
Because God said, don't waste the lamb. <laughs> you got to, if, if it's, if the house is too little for the lamb, if it's too much for the household, I want you to go find another family, somebody that would appreciate you sharing along with them and invite them over. Because if the lamb I don't know if it's a newborn, little, tiny, tender thing, or if it's, you know, 11 months old and pretty well grown. I don't know how big the lamb is, and I don't know how many it'll feed. But if the lamb will feed 12 people, and you've only got six in your household, I need to find another six people. I need to find enough people so that the lamb is not wasted. Don't throw away the lamb. I've got a message for somebody in this house. Don't throw away the lamb. Because this lamb is what's going to carry you out of here. The lamb that shed his blood for you protects you. But that lamb becomes part of you and nourishes you and strengthens you. I wish I had some people to help me preach in this house. Because when I get to thinking about that lamb. Now a lamb, a little tiny lamb, it'll feed however many. I don't know what a lamb will feed. I'm, feed, I'm not that kind of a butcher nor a baker but I will tell you one thing this family Ephesians chapter 3 calls us all a family the family of God the church is a family and I got news for you it's a pretty good sized family it's a big house. When God talked about a house, he wasn't talking about four walls and a roof. He wasn't talking about a foundation and carpet. When God talked about a house, he was talking about daddy and mama and the kids and their wives and their grandkids, everybody with the, land, the name of Zuniga. Every one of them was a part of a family. We got a family in here that has impacted a whole lot of people. And his, the elder's named Gomes. He just, uh, he just the head of the family. He's quiet. He don't say much, but he has impacted this church in a great way. And I love you, elder, for what you have done. I cherish you. But, but that's a big house, and it's going to have to take a big lamb for that house. But let me tell you something, dear saint of God. The Bible said the whole church is named. This whole family is named after Jesus Christ. You know why? Because when we were baptized, we were baptized into his name. We took on his name in baptism. We are a part of the bride of Christ, and we became a part of the family of God. And I got news for you. It's not a question of is the lamb big enough for the family. The question is, is the family big enough for the lamb? Is the house too little for the lamb? I just got to stop and magnify the lamb for a little bit and explain something to you. John, one day on lamb selection day, looked up while he was in the water baptizing people. And lo and behold, his own first cousin was coming down the road, but he didn't see him as a blood relative. He saw him in the prophetic sense, and the Holy Ghost moved on him to say, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. I want to tell you that that Lamb, the Lamb called Jesus Christ, that Lamb's blood is sufficient to cover everybody in this land. Every man, woman, boy, and girl, the blood is sufficient. The blood is enough to cover every one of your sins. The 
blood is big enough to heal every one of your bodies, every one of everything that you go through. This lamb is sufficient. <laughs> Woo! When you sit down and partake of this lamb, I want you to know uh, he's enough. Uh, he's, uh, he's got the answer for every one of your situations. The lamb is big enough. I'm just concerned whether the family's big enough for the lamb. I, I want to tell you, he's big enough. He's big enough to save everybody in a five-mile radius. Somebody say, duh. He's big enough to save all of Dinuba. He's big enough to save Reedley. He's big enough to save Visalia. He's big enough to save San Francisco. He's big enough to save the White House. Somebody help me preach today because I want you to know the Lamb is more than enough. The Lamb of God that I serve, his blood is sufficient. He is enough for every need that you go through. So the devil's convinced you feel the Holy Ghost to say this. The devil's convinced you God doesn't know who I am. He doesn't know where I'm at. He does. I got news for you. He's bigger than that. He's everything that you need. And he knows who you are, where you're at. He knows what you're thinking. He's got it all taken care of. He's got an answer for all of it because this lamb is enough. But what we got to do is we don't want to waste the lamb. I'm glad you're here today because I want you to partake in the greatest Lord's Supper that there has ever been. I want you to be a partaker of the death, the burial, and the resurrection. We're fixing, we're fixing to do a part of that today because Albert and Ricky, they've been praying, they've been researching, they've been studying, they've been, they've been doing that and we're fixing to baptize them in the name of Jesus and they're gonna come out of that water and I pray in the name of the Lord that holy boldness gets upon them and they begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives them the utterance. I've told this congregation what was going on in my mind was, devil, I beat you, I beat you, I beat you. You know why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ had washed away all of my sins. And I want you to know his blood is enough. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how far you've gone. I don't care what you've experienced. I want you to know his blood is enough to forgive you of every sin. He'll meet every need. He's there to give you life and life more abundantly. He'll give you the strength that you've got to have for the journey that you're on. You see, my job is to share the lamb. My job is to let you know you're invited to partake with us <laughs> in the lamb. This is a formal invitation. Why don't you join us? as we celebrate the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Don't be an observer or a skeptic. But why don't you simply make up your mind. I'm going to become a part. I want to, come on, Ricky and Albert, come on up. And go, go, go find 
a place to change and get ready. Those of you that are going to go with them, I appreciate you doing that. But I, I, I want to move this right along because I want some of you, it might be the first time you've ever seen somebody baptized in Jesus' name. But I want you to have an invitation to share the lamb with us because the lamb is big enough to feed all of us, to take care of all of us, to meet every need that is in this place. Left 